to the Loins of History, a podcast connecting the past to the present and correcting historical and political illiteracy. I'm your co-host, Colin, and I'm joined by Jay. And we're going to continue our series on the fall of empires and our mini-series on the fall of the antebellum south, picking up where we left off last week, where we talked about the fall of the south and the reasons it did fall. And now we're going to move into reconstruction. And Jay, before we get started, kind of going over the notes and some of what we talked about before, it seems kind of like as a layman historian, just kind of looking back at Reconstruction, it seems like there were amongst the architects of Reconstruction in the Union competing ideas and there was no clear vision and criteria. It it just seemed like they were moving in separate directions. And then in the South, there was heavy resistance to it. So it even though superficially, you know, Reconstruction was a success on paper because the South was readmitted into the Union, uh, but it left a lot of angst and really didn't help a lot of the people out who it was intended to help out. So that, I mean, just looking at it as a whole, that seems kind of what it was. And now, fast forward 150 years, we're still dealing with some of the fallout of that. And before you make a comment on that, I do want to give two quick shout outs. To some of our listeners, Brian Dennison, he had a great correction and made a, a solid observation on Longstreet. He was a core commander, corrected Jay from last week. And then Joshua Capel, uh, greetings to South Carolina. Thank you, sir. So, Jay, I'll turn it over to you with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. Yeah. And I think in our last episode, I said that Longstreet was a division commander. Brian, thanks for correcting me. He definitely was a core commander. And Joshua, it's nice. I'm not a South Carolinian, but I spent a lot of time in South Carolina. So greetings also to you in, in South Carolina. Uh, yeah, we love hearing from our listeners. We've, this series has generated quite a few comments, which, which mostly some are good. better. Mostly good. Some, some, good some are better than others. <laughs> but that's, it's good because. Yeah, we we hope to generate discussion, and I think it kind of proves the point that like the Civil War is still very much a sensitive topic. It is a very polarizing topic. Um, it is a you know a painful topic when um, when you think about it. I don't recall if I brought this up in the first episode, but you know a, a former coworker of mine said something that really has stuck with me. And his comment was, a lot of people forget uh, that, you know, even though some people in the United States say that the United States has never lost a war, the reality is, is that, you know, a significant portion of the population has, meaning, you know, 11 out of our current 50 states, you know, at the time it was, you know, roughly half, did. And they suffered a military occupation for 12 years after the fact. And that can leave scars. And that can be, you know, a difficult reality to accept something so humiliating to such a prideful culture. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way uh, when I say prideful, prideful culture, but there's the harsh reality that I would just ask other Americans to remember is that there are Americans that have had to cope with losing such a major conflict that it completely eliminated their way of life. Now, immediately feel obligated to throw out the exact same disclaimer I did in our last episode, and that is, that does not mean, I think, that the North shouldn't have won the Civil War, nor do I you know, feel too terribly sorry for the institution of slavery going away. I, I'm glad the North won the Civil War. I'm glad slavery is gone. We are better off as a nation for that. But at a minimum, I think, as fellow Americans, that should evoke some kind of sympathy, some kind of understanding towards other other Americans. Um, and honestly, that's that's kind of a good segue into kind of the, the overall vision for what I wanted to talk about in this episode. So like, like we've talked about this episode and our final in the fall of the Antebellum South series is on Reconstruction and the scars that remain. Reconstruction, you know, in our uh, methodology here, 
falls into the, you know, it was part three. Episode one was on defining the old South. Episode two is on how the South fell, i.e. why the South lost the Civil War. And here in Reconstruction, we're going to talk about why the South never rose again. Um, But in a very real way, the South did kind of rise again. And the South did kind of maintain its culture and did maintain some things. We'll look at that here. I wanted to start things off by giving a quote by probably the main radical Republican leader, a guy named Thaddeus Stevens, who was a Republican representative from Pennsylvania. And this quote kind of summarizes the Northern view, the radical Northern view on what Reconstruction was supposed to accomplish. Uh, And one of my main points here in a little bit will be that pretty early on in uh, 1866, 1867, radical republicanism won out and and against moderate republicanism, and they kind of dominated how Reconstruction would take place for for quite some time, for basically um, 10 years. The first two years, it was kind of a struggle between moderates and radicals. The next 10 years, it'll be radical Republicans kind of saying, this is how Reconstruction is going to take place. It was very damaging towards the South. So this is Thaddeus Stevens. Reconstruction must revolutionize Southern institutions, habits, and manners. The foundations of their institutions must be broken up and relayed, or all our blood and treasure have been spent in vain. Stevens couldn't give a higher cost to the complete and utter collapse of what he saw as the antebellum South. And he laid it in those stark terms, you know, we can kind of understand radical Republicanism here because it, you know, it almost feels too light to put it as a life and death situation. He put it as like an existential situation. Uh, We, we radical Republicans have to completely revolutionize Southern culture, Southern institutions, Southern habits and manners. Like this feels personal. Or everything that we just suffered will be in vain. Jay, is there a is there like a delineation, like line of demarcation between a radical Republican and a moderate Republican? Like, you know, now there's the the House Freedom Caucus or the Mm. squad or something like that. Like, was this an official title or was this just kind of, hey, they had looking back, they all had very similar policies and this was their political stance. So we would call them radical Republicans or did they give themselves that name? Yeah. No, the the answer to that question is yes. Uh, And it fundamentally boiled down to the main difference was on two issues. And the two issues that moderates and radicals, Republicans, couldn't couldn't get on the same page. And that was uh, what to do with all of the white people in the South that, you know, actually aided and abetted, participated in, you know, were office holders in the Confederacy were the actual rebels or the traitors, in their words. Uh, which, just so that it's said, I think it's I think it's unfair to call them traitors because if you call a Southern Confederate a traitor, you have to call the American founding fathers traitors because they dissolved the bonds of their sovereignty in the exact same way. And we've talked about the doctrine of the lesser magistrate in earlier episodes. I digress. Anyway, you know, but in the radical radical Republican words, they called them traitors. So what to do with those people? And then the second issue was what to do with all the freed black people. And moderates and radicals could not agree. The first camp, the moderates, the leader of which was Abraham Lincoln. And then after his assassination, it was, uh, you know, vice president become president Andrew Johnson. They believed that for the the white white supporters of the Confederacy, the best policy was to basically like present a minimum threshold for their for their actions, and then pardon the rest of them. <laughs> like they wanted a very low low threshold to to bring them back into the Union. And Abraham Lincoln really started that policy in 1863. 
We'll talk more about that here in a second. But and then what they wanted to do with all the the freedmen was, you know, there were, there was various proposals. There was not a one weird, one clear way ahead, but they all kind of boiled down to they wanted to give, you know, freed slaves citizenship. But they didn't necessarily want to give them voting rights, and they didn't necessarily want to give them equal protection under the law. So they wanted to maintain some kind of discrepancy, difference, distinction in social status, in political power between the freed people and the freedmen, as they were most commonly referred to, and white people. Again, the emotional impetus behind that was, you know, racism was alive and well in the entire country, not just the South. Um, But secondly, it was because, like, the main moderate Republican emotional drive was to restore the union as quickly as possible. And they wanted to have that low bar do that. And they were trying to have the most, the least amount of consequences for the South. Radical Republicans, on the other hand, which its main leaders, there were several, there were lots because they were primarily congressmen. But the main two were Thaddeus Stevens, who, you know, I said the quote earlier, he was in the House, and a guy named Charles Sumner, who was a senator from Ohio. But he he probably still had a personal grudge against the South after getting caned. (gasps) Was he the guy that got caned? How did I miss that? I think you mentioned it. Hold on. I think you're right. Yeah, he was beaten by Preston Brooks, Charles Sumner. Wow. Yeah, Charles Sumner. Radical you Republican. Yeah, Charles Sumner. Yeah, you were right, man. Wow. Good I, eye. I Good catch, was... Colin. <laughs> yeah, he probably is pissed. Where's that yeah. dude? Brooks? Was that the, the South Carolinian that came that guy? Yeah, Preston um, Brooks. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, um, we had. Sorry. Yeah. So Charles Sumner was the main leader in the Senate. And like, like I mentioned before in in the Stevens quote, their main impetus was to completely revolutionize and like get their pound of flesh from the South. Um, And, you know, in those two broad categories that I mentioned, they, they believed that the white you know, the white rebels, the traitors were needed to be treated as such. They did not want to pardon, you know, Confederate generals. They wanted to hold trials and they were largely unsuccessful in that. Jefferson Davis, which I didn't know this until doing research, he was in prison for two years after the, uh, the Civil War ended you know, somebody had to pay <laughs> for for the Civil War. The second thing on what to do with all the freed slaves, they wanted to give them complete, not just citizenship, but full voting rights for the men. Universal women's suffrage wouldn't become a thing in the United States until 1920. So all black males, they wanted to remove voting rights from the white Southerners that that rebelled, they wanted to confiscate their land. They wanted to give the land to the freed slaves. And uh, they wanted to grant them equal protection under the law. Which, and just to kind of pause here, like, I could see someone listening to these ideas and go like, that doesn't sound radical. That sounds fine. Because see here is that radical republicanism like in a very real sense won out and a lot of you know we take for granted the realities that you know it seems obvious to us post civil war especially post civil rights um and we'll talk about how the seeds were laid there in in towards the end of the episode but um yeah like we we take those those radical republican precepts as granted because radical republicanism did actually win out or win out rather con does that does that cover th- what's yeah, the main was, distinctions between the yeah, two that was very good jay i think you make a, a solid point if you go back and listen to our previous episodes on this or you're going to continue to listen to this you cannot 
part of the way we're trying to tell this is to not look at this through the our 21st century sensibilities. You have to look at it for from a mid 19th century yeah. perspective, right? So it may not sound radical now, but it was mm. radical then. So that's keep that in mind. So when mm. Jay gave his disclaimer at the beginning of the episode, it's really more of a hey. If you want to learn why this happened, let's let's put our mid nineteenth century caps on and try and yeah. understand what was going on. No, th- thank you. That's that is a huge point. And not only and like like I challenge everyone listening to this podcast. Like, not only do we have to put on our eighteen sixties eighteen seventies hats, we have to put on two, three different like perspectives in mind, because radical republicanism wasn't just radical to Democrats. It wasn't just radical to Southerners. It was radical to moderate Republicans. Abraham Lincoln thought that they were going too far. The guy who's on all of our you know pennies, the guy who is was a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on him is in is fantastic in Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> portrayal of him in the movie Lincoln is amazing <laughs> but like it was radical to him the father of you know the GOP the party of Lincoln it was radical to them so we i think we if we really want to understand we have to do the intellectual hard work frankly the emotional hard work to put ourselves in their shoes to really understand where they're coming from because and this is this is uh you know not just good dudery but being a good person is like your ex- your to the extent in which you cannot sympathize with the person you disagree with that is the extent that you don't actually have any ground to stand on to actually disagree with them like maybe maybe put a little bit better is like if you don't understand where that person's coming from like you're in no position uh, to really you know have a discussion because you're just arguing against a straw man if you don't understand where they're coming from you don't even know what you're arguing against so we really like before we you know start pronouncing all of these moral judgments on people that lived over a hundred years ago where we become so arrogant to think that we're automatically better than them because we're not. And I'm, and I'm including Northerners and Southerners in here, like, like across the board, everybody does it. Yeah. I, I challenge all of us to really think through like where these people are coming from. Um, okay. I Colin, what is the, go ahead. I, it's belated, but here's the book recommendation for the week. <laughs> Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, Team of Rivals. Team of Rivals, Fantastic that's right. Fantastic book. So it's, good. If you've never read it, it, we're talking about perspective and kind of dealing with people that disagree with you. Uh, the book kind of outlays uh, Lincoln's campaign for presidency, how he assembled his staff, who his, at the time, who is who he was primarying against for and who was competing on the Republican ticket for the presidency of the United States going into 1860 does a fabulous job of giving. And what's great is she kind of tells history the way that we're trying to, in a sense, not to toot her own horn, but you know, toot toot. She goes back and basically <laughs> says, Hey, this is this is how Abraham Lincoln was raised. Like, this is why he has these sensibilities moving into his political career, because his dad had this upbringing, and because his dad was brought up this way, it rubbed up on Abe Lincoln this way. And and she does that for all of um all of the different members of his staff. But one great thing it walks through is just how he navigated because some of those Republicans, though they weren't radical Republicans at the time, were more, how do I say this, were stronger, more strongly against slavery than he was. So they were Mm -hmm. would have been the ones that would have said, you know, kind of like Thaddeus Stevens, we if if we don't completely uproot Southern the Southern way of life, it was all in vain. Versus Lincoln, and if you read this book, he really just wanted to preserve the Union ending slavery was the means to that end. So fabulous yeah. book. Sorry about that. But yeah, great book. No, you're good. Thank Highly you. Highly recommend. Yeah. In the movie adaptation, which it's it's not a full movie adaptation, the movie Lincoln with Daniel Day Lewis, which he is one of my favorite actors. I love almost every movie he's in. Uh 
but the movie adaptation kind of takes a lot of the stuff that she wrote in that book and then they kind of made a different movie. She focuses a lot on the political intrigue stuff and how he was as a leader. They touch on that in the movie, but the movie is more of just like a story of, you know, that particular time in Lincoln's life. Anyway. Um, yeah. So that's, that is definitely our book recommendation for the week. Hey, real quick, just to kind of give an example before we talk about how radical re- radical Republicanism really took root and then how that impacted the South. I wanted to talk about two things, and that is Lincoln's 10% plan and Congress's response to that, which was the Wade Davis bill. Uh, President Lincoln, beginning in 63, so like the Emancipation Proclamation, there's, there's a, uh, you know, modern historians begin reconstruction with the Emancipation Proclamation. That hasn't always been the case. That's been kind of a more modern take, um, which I, I don't know. I don't have too, too strong an opinion on when we should officially start reconstruction, but I think it is helpful to think of like the Emancipation Proclamation as like Lincoln's first big act in trying to lay a foundation for what life would be like in the South after the Civil War. And his 10% plan in 1860, beginning in like 1864, what he sometimes referred to as his Louisiana plan, because uh, in like by December of 1864, three states, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas, had already cooperated with the 10% plan. And uh, in short, the 10% plan was was a policy that a state could be readmitted to the Union if 10% of its 1860 census population took an oath of office of allegiance, or not an oath of, not an oath of office, an oath of allegiance to the U.S., and they swore that they had never taken up arms against the Union. If 10% of a state's population did that, in addition to a few other things, For example, the state had to abolish slavery in their new state constitution um, uh, and and some other stuff. The state would be readmitted to the union, 10%. Um, And as an incentive to take this oath, Lincoln said, we will pardon you, like blanket, blanket pardon, amnesty, if you just take this oath and do this kind of thing. So it was like a... High incentive, high incentive. You could just get a blank, you know, a free clean slate. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and your state could be readmitted to the union. Like I said, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas actually did that. The problem with this, and this is just Jay's two cents, that definitely was too low of a threshold. <laughs> I I kind of see myself if I would have been living in Pennsylvania at this time, I probably would have been a moderate Republican. But even then, it's like 10%. (laughs) That's really low, man. (laughs) To give a biblical reference, do you remember when, uh, I encourage everyone to go out and read the Bible for the story, but uh, if you've ever come across the story of of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll spare the city for 10 people. It's kind of like that. I'll spare the South for 10%. (laughs) Just keep driving it lower and lower. (laughs) You can cut that out if you want, but. No, 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 uh, that's good. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's like if you thought, if you find like 50 good men in the city, will you spare? He's like, yeah. And he's like, what about 40? <laughs> what about 10? 10% about 10? of the South. Just yeah. 10% of the South. You know, yeah. what's interesting, did they have any records of how many Southerners actually took that oath? Did they reach you know, the 10% threshold? A, that's a really good question. So those three states did, and they like they kind of made it because Congress had not gotten its act together and had... Um, you know, established a different policy. Lincoln kind of was being proactive in that regard. So those three states did it, but I didn't see like a number, but they determined, you know, however many, uh, it was over the 10% threshold. And again, it's important to remember, like the reason why Lincoln did this was he, he started the civil war. (laughs) The maybe, maybe South Carolina started the civil war. I don't know. But anyway, um, and he did that to preserve the union. He was very clear that preserving the union was his number one overarching goal. So it makes sense that his, you know, initial reconstruction policies were like low bar just to get people or just to get states readmitted into the union. But it was too soft. And that's 
and that's why it didn't last. Congress had other other plans. The first congressional attempt to come up with their own was called the Wade Davis bill. It essentially took Lincoln's 10% plan and said, we raise you to 51%. And I said that everyone in that, that majority had to take an oath that they called the ironclad oath. That would have effectively prevented anybody that had fought in the Confederacy from uh, taking the oath. They couldn't have. There's, there's no, there's no way. Like they'd swung the pendulum too far to the opposite direction, and v- Lincoln actually vetoed that bill. The good old pocket veto, i.e., he just stuck the bill in his pocket and didn't do anything with it. So that. The way Davis bill didn't, but that was kind of like the initial ground. So like the war over reconstruction, the terms were laid. We would see like, okay, what, what are we going to do with all the white people that rebelled? That was the first main issue. Um, and it kind of, kind of went from there. So moving on here, I just wanted to kind of quickly cover how we transitioned from like Lincoln and moderate Republicanism to really like radical Republicanism taking over the reconstruction movement really getting to dictate the terms and how you know at first glance they were ultimately successful so in 1866 civil war has been over for um, about 2 years at this point so the election of 1866 I believe is think it was still in november you know civil war has been over for almost 2 years radical republicans completely took a control of congress so lincoln was assassinated Five days after Lee surrendered at Appomattox, I think, uh, like very, like less than a week after, in April of '65, Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, that made Andrew Johnson uh, president, and Andrew Johnson was actually previously kind of seen as a radical. But whenever he took over, he very much decided to continue Lincoln's moderate approach, which. I didn't mention this before. Lincoln had a very famous statement by saying that his policy was defined as with malice towards none. And Andrew Johnson kind of took this mantle and he can, he kind of furthered the moderate Republicanism, but that was extremely unpopular. So, you know, fast forward a year and almost two radical Republicans took like massive majorities, like two over two thirds in both the house and the Senate. Remember none of the Southern states, none of the 11 Confederate states had been readmitted to the union at this point. Um, 1864, you know, Louisiana, Tennessee and Arkansas, they had like done the 10% thing, but Congress had not actually ratified their state constitutions. So there were no Southern Congress, congressmen in either the Senate or the House. So radical Republicans won over two-thirds majority in both. And as far as vetoes are concerned, that that gives you the ability to override presidential vetoes. So Johnson became extremely unpopular. He went to went to war with the rebel, radical Republicans and lost. Um, and he actually ended up getting impeached because he fired the Secretary of War, a guy named Edwin M. Stanton, which during the Civil War, Congress passed a law called the Tenure of Office Act that basically like said the president cannot fire certain ministers, uh, and that that, war, that that law had not been repealed. It was, it was a wartime measure. It had not been repealed. You know, Congress was trying to check the power of the White House in the first place. And they they impeached him. They found him guilty for violating the Tenure of Office Act. He wasn't supposed to fire. You know, then we called it the Secretary of War. We now call that same position the Secretary of Defense. Pretty high-level cabinet position. But he ended up being acquitted by the Senate, so he wasn't actually removed from office. And by acquitted by the Senate, what happened was is they failed to reach the two-thirds majority that the Senate needed to reach to actually remove him from office by one vote. Uh, so it was a majority of the senators found him uh, found him guilty, but they didn't want to go so far as to actually remove him from office. So once Johnson was impeached, that was kind of like the death knell 
of moderate Republican policy, that last check against radical Republicans in Congress, i.e. the White House, was effectively suppressed and uh, radical Republicans would run the show. So a few things, really the biggest, um, you know, there were tons of pieces of legislation that were passed, so on and so forth. But I just want to cover in this episode the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th constitutional amendments, because those are the those are the pieces of legislation that really solidified the radical Republican agenda, specifically with regards to what to do with freedmen. The 13th Amendment actually abolished slavery, um, like legally speaking. The Emancipation Proclamation, you know, great document, great speech. But legally, it was kind of didn't really do too much because it freed slaves. Territory is not controlled by the Union. The 13th Amendment, however, did do that. The 14th Amendment was birthright citizenship to everyone, regardless of race and previous, like, forget the legal term. It's like previous history of servitude or something like that. Previous past of servitude. It doesn't matter if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're a slave. It doesn't matter anything like that. If you're born in the United States, you are a citizen of the United States. And the 15th Amendment granted those same people, all citizens, men, the right to vote. Now, this was at the federal level. And one of the main struggles between moderate and radical Republicans was this, the federal versus states' rights issue that was still a thing that didn't just go away. We don't have an almighty federal government <laughs> at this point. And even like a lot of Republicans were hesitant to be too prescriptive on how voting should be done because that was seen as a state issue uh, since you know 1783 when the Constitution was ratified. So they said that, hey, there will be this right to vote, but the details and the enforcement and a lot of that stuff was kind of left ambiguous. But nevertheless, it was a constitutional amendment of which if your state was going to be readmitted into the union, it had to you know, submit to the constitution as the supreme law of the land. Nothing in your state constitution could contradict that. But as you can imagine, there were legal battles out the wazoo for a really long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, to this day, I believe there's still legal battles on on this kind of stuff. So, okay, that covers the North. <laughs> that covers what was going on in terms of the Northern uh, uh, views on Reconstruction and how Reconstruction was going to be implemented. I want to spend the rest of this episode talking about what was going on in the South from the Southern perspective. And this honestly was like kind of fun to research because it's not all good. <laughs> like <laughs> it's like, you know, first, first and probably foremost, everyone knows about the KKK, right? Um, I, so yeah, I'll just go ahead and say it. I grew up playing football as a kid and there was one town that we would go in that had an active KKK chapter. Uh, and on my football team, my youth football team, like kids, uh, we were like nine, eight or nine. Uh, we had one black kid on the team, just one. And I distinctly remember our coaches, like when we got off the bus, it was an away game. <laughs> this is not my hometown. <laughs> this is, it was an away game. Uh, and when we got off the bus, the coaches... I don't want to say my former black teammates name, but the coaches were like, all right, kids, everybody circle this guy <laughs> and like literally made us like form a circle around him because, and I didn't like know at the time, but I was later told that it was like, because that was the, that was the town that had the active KKK chapter and of which that team had zero black kids on theirs. I mean, we thought we were being progressive by having the one, but, but the point being is that like, you know, that was the nineties, you know, it was a long time after reconstruction. Anyway, everybody knows about the KKK. Um, and you know, the, the initial history of the KKK is, um, not necessarily controversial as much as it is like, 
it's such an emotional, like we know what we know. It's not unknown. That's what I mean when I say not necessarily controversial. Like yeah, it's there's not a no secret. Deba- there's no debate. Like, whoa, did they mean, did they mean this? Is this the secret of what they were trying to do? It's like, no, it's, it's very well known and established. Yeah. yeah. It's, and I actually, I referenced Victor Davis Hanson um, in our last episode in his book, Ripples of Battle, because he's got a single chapter on Shiloh, but he, he talks at length about the KKK. And I think Victor Davis Hanson is a great resource here because Hanson's from California. Like he, I think he has a very neutral opinion in terms of, uh, well, maybe not a neutral opinion, but like he's a good third party to kind of read when you're, when you're doing all this stuff. And he, uh, he explains the origins of the KKK very well. It talks about the role of Nathan Bedford Forrest in that whole thing. And in short, what Hansen says is, yes, it is actually true that the very beginnings of the KKK, which Nathan Bedford Forrest did not start the KKK, it already existed. He was its first grandmaster, but it had already existed prior to Forrest taking over. And it was a it was a relatively small organization, and they weren't they weren't just uh, lynching black people indiscriminately. That at the very beginning, again, read read Hanson if you don't believe me. But the main purpose of the KKK was to you know, in their words, defend Southern honor. Right, like it was to it was to chase out carpetbaggers and scallywags. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and it was to protect, like, you know, what they viewed as businesses, you know, all these different things. Now, what very quickly happened was their business model, so to speak, was um, copied all over the South. And those, like, unofficial KKK chapters did do the lynching mobs. And by and large, very quickly, the the KKK turned into the incredibly racist organization that we know it today. In it, in one of the the proof is in the pudding type deals is that Nathan Beffer Forrest later testified before Congress. This is all public record. Later testified before Congress because he resigned as the as the grandmaster of the KKK, and he basically badmouthed the KKK before Congress. Basically saying, like, this has gotten out of control, I want no part of this, blah, blah, blah. Now, if one were to interpret what I'm saying, that I, like, love Nathan Bedford Forrest and want to defend the KKK, you're not listening to what I'm actually saying. <laughs> the rea- But the facts are what they are, and I bring all this up to say that there was a strong Southern urge at the beginning of Reconstruction to protect the former way of life that it had. Racism and all. It was it was all there. And there was bad mixed in with it, and there was others, <laughs> other things mixed in with it. But the reality is, is like I bring this up to say, like, I I I've heard for quite some time, like, the KKK wasn't, you know, it was defense southerners. And I just want to say, like, that's that actually is true. But it's also actually true that in the very early days of the KKK, the gross racism, white supremacy, you name it, was also absolutely there and took over the organization so quickly and so thoroughly that even Nathan Bedford Forrest decided to distance himself from the organization. So I think it um, I think it kind of got supercharged a little bit in the twenties, actually. I think the twenties is where well, maybe the kind of like the what was that movie Birth of a Nation? Uh, mm-hmm. That was in the teens, but then the twenties, it kind of got revitalized, and that's closer to what the modern day KKK that we see now, because it kind of died off after Bedford Forrest testimony. It sort of kind of went. I don't want to say it disbanded, but it definitely lost membership and it kind of lost its foothold, mm-hmm. especially after Reconstruction. There was no need for it, so it sort of yeah. kind of went away, and then. As the progressive era began, and you can go back and listen to our political history, we start talking about with the rise of Wilson and some others, it kind of got a, a rebranding, if you will, or uh, restarted. And that's sort of the modern interpretation of the KKK we see now, or iteration, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reality is, is that history is nuanced. 
And if we suffice ourselves with cheap, half-baked explanations, like we're going to miss the truth. Uh, and again, like that goes both ways, right? The, to say the KKK was like this wonderful organization, that is a cheap, half-baked statement. <laughs> yep. uh, nope, they weren't. <laughs> yeah. To say that they were, you know, that they've been racist all along and blah, 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 is also a cheap, half-baked statement. So it's like, there's nuance. We need, we need to make nuance cool again in our, in our political and historical discourse. But maybe, Colin, should we start saying that at the beginning of our episodes? Like making we're here nuance to, cool again. <laughs> we're making nuance cool again. Anyway, uh, intellectual rigor is appreciated. Anyway. So that's just one example of these Southern organizations that started popping up. There was a larger thing basically called the Redeemer Movement, and it kind of kind of coalesced around these paramilitary Southern organizations. There was the Red Shirts, uh, and there was another organization called the White League. The White League was big in Louisiana. And we're actually going to talk about the White League here again in a second. But, you know, these what these paramilitary organizations were doing, they were doing everything, good and bad. Everything was being done. Voter, you know, when black people would get, excuse me, get the right to vote, they would do voter intimidation. Uh, when Republicans would hold like political meetings and campaigns, like they would come in with guns and like break up the meetings and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but they would also like, you know, if a Southern plantation, if, uh, you know, if, if a Northern carpetbagger was trying to come in and say like, hey, I own this land now, they'd be like, with a gun, get the heck off me my property, this person's property, you know, et cetera. Like, um, <laughs> you know, it was very much kind of this, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly type deal. Um, uh, again, not trying to morally equivocate everything, just trying to cover all the bases here, the full spectrum of the truth. So, um, one example, this is getting to our, our uh, white league here is worth mentioning. Fast forwarding to 1874, we talked about in our last episode that there was a bitter, you know, at the end at the end of the Civil War, there was a lot of blame for who lost and why they lost. And Robert E. Lee was kind of seen as this like hero, a guy that could do no wrong. But there was one guy in particular that caught a lot of flack for losing the Civil War, and that was good old James Longstreet, the guy that uh, I was corrected on. He was a corps commander under Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. He's blamed for a lot of stuff. Well, one of the reasons why he gets blamed is because old, old James Longstreet later became a Republican and then later uh, fought a battle <laughs> in New Orleans in 1873 called the Battle of Liberty Place, where James Longstreet led a group of union soldiers. So he's like, you know, from the Southern perspective, fighting for the other side now, even though this is 1874, fought for the other side in the streets of New Orleans to, to put down an armed insurrection by the, by the White League. So that's just one example, which, by the way, James Longstreet ended up being appointed as the, basically, ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> Speaking of the fall of Constantinople, just connecting it right there. Yeah, there you go. He he ended up getting becoming friendly with Rutherford B. Hayes, and Hayes appointed him to be the ambassador to Ottoman Empire. Go go figure. The dude that was blamed. So Southerners hate this guy. Very much seen as a traitor to the Southern cause. Yeah, very much of a God. Who's the Revolutionary War dude? Help. <laughs> Which Revolutionary War Most, dude? famous traitor in the Revolutionary War. Oh, Benedict, Benedict Arnold. Arnold. Benedict Arnold. I almost called him Eggs Benedict, but Eggs Benedict Benedict. Arnold. <laughs> Benedict Arnold. Eggs Benedict. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Very much a Benedict Arnold in the eyes of Southerners. So, um, yeah, Longstreet's despised. Lee, like, even wrote a lot of scathing stuff about his conduct, like public letters that were published in the newspapers which didn't do anything to help Lee's credibility. Or sorry, Longstreet's credibility. Okay. Let's talk about scallywags and carpetbaggers. I feel like no no episode on Reconstruction in the South would be complete without scallywags and carpetbaggers. 
Carpetbaggers is a term that I'd heard growing up, <laughs> referring still to here any, today. still still alive and well. Um, which it's really funny. The a joke that I've told basically my entire adult life is that I was not raised in a racist house, a racist household, which is a true statement. But there was a, an entire group of people that were to be blamed for all of the South's problems. <laughs> and it was Yankees. It wasn't black people. It was Yankees. It's like a line from King of the Hill. Yeah. Those, Bobby, those I hate New Yorkers. Yorkers. Yeah. And it was, it was carpetbaggers. Do you know when I heard the term carpetbagger come back up no, during COVID, it. when everybody from New York and, oh, uh, yeah. you know, New Jersey and all those areas were fleeing to the South? It was like, you know, and houses mm-hmm. were going off the market before you could blink or whatever. You heard carpetbaggers because it was a bunch of boomers from the Northeast that wanted to get out of there and they came South. So basically, the definition of a carpetbagger is, some, is from someone up North who moved down to the South generally and stereotypically to exploit the situation. They were trying to make money. They were trying to get the, get the land. They were trying to, you know, requisition businesses that had gone bankrupt, blah, 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 blah. And I guess a bunch of them had bags made out of carpet (laughs) that was in vogue at that time. And they, they'd come down. There's even a carpet bagger that shows its face in the movie gone with the wind that I've referenced a few times here, but, Anyway, scallywags were Southerners who were sympathetic to Republicans, who were sympathetic to the North that wanted to like implement Reconstruction. Those are those are scallywags. So the freedmen and the scallywags were the the causes of all the problems. And what really motivated the Redeemers movements in the South. Okay, bringing this up to the election of eighteen seventy six. So this is uh, Ulysses S. Grant had just finished his second term, I believe. Um, Yeah, that smells right. His second term. And it was Rutherford B. Hayes. And it was a really close election uh, between Democrats and Republicans. The Republican candidate was Rutherford B. Hayes. And it all came down to three states. Ironic or incidentally enough, it was the last three states that had not been quote unquote redeemed. And by redeemed, you know, this, uh, this redeemers movement, one of their goals was to replace all of the Southern state legislatures that had all become Republican so that they could be readmitted into the union was to basically like throw off the occupation and put Southern Democrats back in charge of the majority. When that had happened, when Republicans were back, or sorry, when Democrats were back in charge of the state legislature, that state was considered to be redeemed. There were three states by the election of 1876. Sorry, I think I misspoke earlier. There was an election of 1876, and that was South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. They still had Republicans in charge. Those three states all had contested election results. They those three states ended up submitting two different forms of ballots, <laughs> one for each candidate up to Washington, D.C. to be ratified by Congress or certified by Congress. Uh, Congress started doing some wheeling and dealing, and there ended up over the next year in 1877, there was this event called the Compromise of 1877. Uh, it's also known as the Corrupt Bargain, which there's actually been three corrupt bargains uh, in the United States, this would have been the second one. So not the original and not the last crop bargain. But basically, uh, rumor has it that Rutherford B. Hayes said, hey, if you guys vote for me, if you guys figure this election stuff out to where I get these votes and thus win the election, I will withdraw all uh, Union Army occupation forces out of your states. And they were like, sweet, check, done. And Rutherford B. Hayes was elected. And this, this is kind of seen as the end of Reconstruction because once the, once the military occupation went away, and these were the last three states, 
Reconstruction was basically over. Very shortly thereafter, you know, Democrats would um, get put in charge of these states. And that's what kind of brings us into, you know, the time period really from post Reconstruction into the civil rights era, where there were still significant amounts of inequality. Uh, a lot of these Democrat controlled legis- state legislatures would pass laws that would basically, the word is disenfranchised black voters, i.e. like, you know, the 15th amendment gives them the right to vote, but then the states, and this is why I mentioned this earlier, the states would give these like, or pass these laws that would have super restrictive voter registration requirements of which literacy was a big part of it. So for example, this wasn't universal, but one of the things that they would do is they basically say like, if you can't pass this literacy test, you can't vote. Well, then you know, they're like, well, there's a lot of white people be able to pass this literacy test. I was going to say, either. I, I encourage you to go Google some of those and try and pass the test. <laughs> yeah, that actually would be kind of fun. What were their literacy no, I, tests? I'm, I'm being serious. Uh, if you're a listener, yeah. I just go Google the literacy tests of, you know, the yeah. 1880s or 1870s. And you'd be like, mm-hmm. oh, dang, this is, this is really tough. But what they did to get around that little measure is they said they would grandfather you in. They said, if you've ever had the right to vote... You can you still have your right to vote, of which that that exclusively eliminated you know freed slaves. So there were things like that were being implemented in a lot of these legislatures, and that's why uh, you know equality, political equality, would be a continued battle for another hundred years, and that is another podcast episode for another day. But that is a good segue into kind of. One of the last things I want to talk about, and that is enduring legacies of of Reconstruction and how that went down here in the South. Kind of in no particular order, I wanted to kind of just briefly talk about like, okay, this is why the South fell. This is the impacts of the South falling. But like, we very much still feel this pain today. And we even mentioned it in the first episode. And kind of the first thing is like the monuments to the Confederate veterans. Um, You know, 2020, this was huge, you know, in the wake of the George Floyd killing. uh, And, you know, there was a lot of backlash about getting rid of Confederate monuments. Um, all All I really wanted to say was, I think those monuments, which not a single, I mean, I There's so many. I've not seen all of them by long shot, right? But I've seen a lot of them. And I haven't seen a single one of them that celebrated slavery, that celebrated racism, that celebrated rebellion, none of that stuff. They're all very careful to celebrate the war dead, right? And the heroes that actually fought in the war. I think it it is... It is an aspect of healing to be able to grieve and honor people who gave up your, who gave up their lives for you. And I, and I, you know, again, I would challenge our listeners who may not, who may not agree with that statement. It's, you have to put yourself in the place of a Southerner to understand like, you know, that might, that person that died, that's your brother, that's your dad. Right, that was your grandfather. That was your son. There were veterans parades for Confederate veterans. I think even in like the forties, you would see like, you know, in World War II around that time frame, like honoring Confederate veterans was very much a thing. Um, the majority, kind of, not the majority, but quite a few of the military bases up until the couple months ago were named after Confederate generals. Yeah, I think a lot of that stuff is to- was tolerated because that was part of the reconciliation process. It's like, you know, one of the things that I like about Abraham Lincoln was that he understood the value of compromise. And, you know, I think by any objective metric, Lincoln was very shrewd politically. And one of the reasons why he was that way was because he understood compromise. And I think if we could pick another word to make great again in this podcast, next to nuance, it would be compromise. And that is like, if you want to make progress, 
you have to accept certain things that you may not want to accept, right? Like that's literally what compromise is all about. It is you have to be willing to kind of give up some ground, to cede some territory, to humble yourself um, so that we can move forward as a society or as individuals or, or whatever. I'll, go ahead. As you say, here's my, my two cents on the monuments piece. Um, the fact is, right now, it's not really even any, any more about a confederacy versus union type of conversation. And this this might be a, a prequel to a future episode that we do, but it's really more of a misdirection of political angst uh, or a channeling of political angst. And, and here's what I mean by that. During times of extreme political uncertainty or instability, oftentimes leaders, and you can look at through this throughout history, I mean, would start a war or find an enemy that they could unite and rally people behind and kind of distract people from current problems. And if you think about, you mentioned 2020, you had COVID, you had uh, George Floyd, you had all sorts of different things. It was very convenient and very easy to suddenly shift all of that political angst that was going around directly onto the monuments and say, well, this is the enemy because it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about it, uh, the the civil war ended a hundred and what, 120 years ago, 123 years ago. Um, So it's, it's an enemy that's long- What's that? Almost 140. Civil War. Oh, no. 160. Excuse me. 160 years ago. 60. 160. Wow. Anyway. That's the old joke that historians are really bad at math. <laughs> Gosh, 160 years ago. 162 <laughs> years ago. It, that's besides the point. The, they're long since dead. They can't defend themselves. They can't make any kind of statement that we sort of tried to do on their behalf in this episode. So it's very easy. Yeah tear the monument down. This is the enemy. This is the sign of victory. And it sort of yeah. just redirects this political angst. They did it. The communists did it in Spanish civil war. They would dig up nuns and, you know, mm. shoot their bodies. And, you know, the Bolsheviks, they would do it all the time to dig up dead imperialists. And, you know, I think that the, they did it in China too. But, you know, that's the thing. It's like, it, it's a, it's a, it's an easy target. You don't actually have to start a war. You can just go after somebody that's already dead and it's kind of a symbol. So I don't think the conversation anymore is so much North versus South versus this is an enemy that we can put a few current topics like racism, rebellion, white supremacy. We can just tag it to that and then go tear down these monuments. And it's kind of like without actually doing anything, we're Mm -hmm. doing something. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I had another coworker who was a black man, good dude. And he, we would have a few conversations. This is not recently. Um, And we were talking about the Confederate flag in a similar regard. Uh, And he was of the position that the Confederate flag should, you know, is a symbol is objectively a symbol of racism. And, but he was actually able to articulate like why that was the case, as opposed to this, just again, cheap half baked view. Uh, my view was long time. Like I don't own a single Confederate flag. Like, I don't know, like that's just not my jam, but I do tend to sympathize with those who want to maintain Confederate flags. At a minimum, it's a freedom of speech issue. You know, if you want to, if it's legal and if the Supreme Court said it's legal to burn an American flag, (laughs) you know, if that includes like you want to burn the Confederate flag, like go for it, man. Like that's sure right. You can do that. In the same, so if I can, if we can burn an American Confederate flag, like, but I can't hang one, like it's literally worse to display one or have one in my home. Like, I don't know. Again, I don't have Confederate flags, uh, but the what was really helpful. What my what my uh, coworker said at that time, because he was he's from Virginia, mm. and what he was saying, he's like, all I saw as a black man, as a black kid growing up in Virginia, was black people being lynched, black people being burned, black people being tortured, and there were always Confederate flags hanging in the background. He's like, so to me. That flag is nothing but a symbol of rate of race hate and racism. And that at least like I have had to go through and I'm still going through the, you know, the the rationalization of like, okay, I know what this flag means to me. 
I know I understand what this flag means to other people, but this is a new category of people, ones that I didn't really grow up around, where I understand. I understand the angst against it. I understand all that issue. But kind of bringing it back to the, the Confederate monument ordeal is I like, I haven't, again, I haven't seen a single Confederate monument that said anything about slavery, anything, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I think by and large and under most circumstances, removing monuments is the, is a bad call. I really don't have strong feelings about like, you know, 2020 when Nikki Haley was the governor of South Carolina, removing the Confederate flag from the grounds of the, of the state Capitol. To me, well, it was kind of like, okay. <laughs> That controversy was actually, so it was initially, it actually initially flew on top of the state house in South Carolina right. and then they yeah. took it down and they just moved it somewhere else on the state grounds. And then that's where they removed it. And, you know, for that, I kind of see like, okay, do we really want a rebel flag flying on a government, on a U.S. government building? Yeah. And to your point, everything that it represents, it kind of represents a lot of different things. So do we want that to fly over a government building when it definitely obje- objectively, not just to it objectively was a rebel flag. Do yeah. we really want it's like that would be like I don't know, it's kinda odd for me that the losers of the Civil War would wave the flag on a government building. So yeah. and because then the if a government entity does something like that, whether they like it or not, they are explicitly or implicitly saying, I agree with this. I'm okay yeah. with it. So yeah. you gotta be careful it- there. Yeah, I think it, and this is actually a good like summary point. It's, I know amongst people who like the flag and who want to keep the flag, it's not a symbol of rebellion. It's a symbol of heritage. Now, I know that's packed with all kinds of controversy, but hear me out for a second, <laughs> people. And that is like, what they what they mean by heritage is literally, and again, I grew up around tons of these people. I'm from the rural South, okay? <laughs> That's been challenged once in this series, but I promise I'm from the rural South. Grew up around a lot of Confederate flags. Anyway, not one of them. I haven't heard a single person advocate for rebellion, nor have I heard a single person advocate for like violence or, uh, you know, inequality for black people. Like it was just like this, like I... I, as a, not me, Jay, but like me person who wants to keep my Confederate flag, I identify as a Southerner from Dixie. Like, this is my land. This is my country. Like, it's it's simple. Now, now granted, are there exceptions? Of course, there's exceptions. And, and honestly, Colin, as you were talking about, like, do we really want the, this flying on the state building? Like, I think I agree that it was probably the right call to remove it from the grounds of the state capitol building because, kind of going back to my earlier point about you know my, my colleague who was saying that, that that flag represents nothing but hate and racism to me. You know, if you're in the state government, you have to be like nonpartisan, right? right. Like, and if it and if it is such a controversial symbol, like maybe don't ban it in your state. Like again, kind of going back to the freedom of speech thing, but at the same time, like. Don't fly it on the grounds of the state. Yeah, because then you're you're you you are everything that it represents. You are behind, whether good or bad. Right. One more note here to really just kind of to foot stomp the like putting ourselves in the place of Southerners during Reconstruction, and that is just like the South was occupied by a by a military force for twelve years and had a hostile political party in charge of them. But I was actually reminded the state of North Carolina, guess how many um, uh, Republicans have been governor of North Carolina since the end of reconstruction? Three. One. One. And he served one term uh, and it was within, it's been within the last like 10 years. I forget his name. One guy. And the reason why uh, North Carolina has had Democrats in charge for so long in terms of governorships is because of the Redeemer movement. It's because, like, I believe the red shirts were very well organized within North Carolina. And it was like they saw North Carolinians at the time saw themselves as like we were occupied by foreign military power for over a decade. And now that we have our political freedom back, 
we are never going back to to that that previous case. It would be I've actually the Amazon series The Man in the High Castle, like it's a fun, you know, alternate history if Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan actually won World War II and and split the United States and occupy. Like and I'm just thinking it's like it would be like okay, the Nazis occupy New York City and then 10 years after they leave you're like you know what let's elect a nazi like <laughs> no you would never elect a nazi again <laughs> right like there would never be a, like there would never be a valid political party in the minds of your, of your of the people so anyway like an extreme example to kind of prove the point like uh it's always just kind of been funny to me that even though you know we've we've talked about history of political parties and different in other podcast episodes but it's like you know even after the the 20th century where republicans are now seen as the republic or as the conservative party you still have democrats as governors in places like north carolina and it and it definitely has something to do with reconstruction and the civil war okay the la- the last thing that i would just want to say as a quick recap is you know kind of close in Tying the the tying the bow, tying the knot here, putting a bow on the package. What am I trying to say here? <laughs> on why the antebellum South fell, and I've kind of brought up these ideas in our other two episodes, and I wanted to end this one by talking about it again, real briefly, and that is pride, uh, racism, and white supremacy, and a failure to modernize or a failure to adapt. You know, we've talked about Southern pride, like that's been a that's been a recurring theme, and it's not all bad. I think there's good good things about honor culture. I think there's there's good things about you know standing up for family and like conservative values. I think those are good things, uh, but it can also get in the way, and it can get in the way when uh, you know you think you're an inherently better fighter because you're a Southern knight, and that the the wage slave from you know, Pittsburgh isn't going to be able to fight you in combat and you learn the hard way. That's not, not a true statement. Um, the second thing is the racism and the white supremacy. Like it, it was a thing. And I'm, I'm painfully aware that those terms carry so much baggage today, especially post 2020. And like I said, in our first episode, like I cringe when I hear so much of the conversations surrounding racism and white supremacy. And it's, and it's unfortunate. It really is unfortunate. Like there's very much of a chicken little effect, um, in, you know, our political discourse today when, when everything is racism, nothing is racism. And it's unfortunate because racism does actually exist and racism is actually a bad thing. And when we have lost any kind of significant meaning in any kind of significant conversation about racism, we've lost the ability to deal with real racism. Uh, So I say all that to say like racism was very much alive and well all over the country, but it was in a special form in the South in a way that just led the South to make really stupid decisions uh, and to commit like gross evils against fellow human beings, like made in the image of God. It's, it is, it is something that has to be said. Like, even though I've done my very best to try to present a sympathetic uh, view to the South, like it is like the South has to be able to acknowledge its sins in order to move forward. And that last part, uh, last part about moving forward is something that the South really failed to do. Like when your empire or whenever your civilization and your society, your culture, it can't adapt, it can't modernize. It puts itself at significant risk of not being able to deal with threats. I've already started research on the fall of the French third Republic. And it's like, you know, in 1940, or 39, really, when World War II first got started, the French Third Republic was prepared for 1914 all over again. They had not modernized, they had not adapted, they didn't know what they were doing, and the Germans, who absolutely had modernized, uh, came in and just waxed the floor with them. Like, that's what happens. That's what happened with the South. Like, Rhett Butler and Gone with the Wind saying, like, you're going to beat the North with what? With what? Sticks? Like, uh, 
civilizations, we have to move forward, we have to adapt. And I think probably the biggest challenge for conservatives today, not just Southerners, but just any conservatives here in the States is, and I've brought this up so many times, and that is like, how do you, how do you move conservative values forward instead of trying to go back to, you know, 1981 when Ronnie Reagan, that was a movie quote, by the way, or movie reference, by the way, but when Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, was inaugurated, we're, we're in a different world. We're in a different time. We have to adapt. You have to modernize. And if you walk backwards into the future, you're going to trip. So turn around, face the facts, face reality, and, and learn to adapt and actually provide a future in which our children's children can still live under those same conservative values um, that we so that we are so fond of appraising. So with that, I'm done. <laughs> great stuff, Jay. No, great summary. I think you captured kind of the feelings that we feelings and uh, <clears throat> facts that we wanted to cover for this. It's a lot to think. It's a lot to think about. I think it's important for us to take a look and self-examine that with that, especially as U S citizens for foreign listeners, still good, still beneficial. Learn a little American history. Um, for those of you that are listening, please like, like, leave a comment on Spotify, Podcast Attic, Apple Podcast. If you're on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment and give us a like as well, or five star rating on the other platforms. Subscribe to our podcast on YouTube. We are Jay and I are both on social media via some iteration of Loins of History. You can message us. You can repost us some of our stuff that we get on every now and then. We do like interacting with our fans. So whether through DMs or just Gmail, we do appreciate it. We've gotten some positive feedback that we like to incorporate into our show. So thank you for listening to the Loins of History, and we'll see you next week on the next Fall of Empires episode.